Hello and welcome to Crucible of Words for more dedicated legacy action. Today we are playing Green Black Turbidets, a deck which is very near and dear to my heart and you can find some excessive detail and a primer about the deck on my Patreon which is in the description below. We're trying something a bit different out today with the deck because if you don't try new stuff out then you never learn. So we're going to try mixing up some of our protection spells a little bit and see how that feels. So. What is our deck trying to do for those who are uninitiated into the world of green black depths we're trying to make a 2020 using dark depths in order to do this we either remove all the counters with hex mage or we copy it with thespian stage and thespian stage becomes a copy with no counters on and becomes a 2020. then we swing and our opponent dies to facilitate this we got a bunch of tutors in sylvan scrying and crop rotation we've got fast mana to make this happen quickly in the form of elvish spirit guide and lotus petal and then we have ways of making sure that we can actually connect with it in terms of our Duresses, Thought Seizes, and today we're playing three Knots of This World and an Apostle's Blessing. So the interesting thing about Apostle's Blessing, which is one of the things I want to try out today, is the fact that this card gives protection from artifacts. So we can use it to go through Thopter tokens. And also, it's a two mana spell that we can pay for one, which means we can play it through a Chalice for one mana to get through a load of Thopters. Now, eight cast is a bit of an annoying matchup because of all the Thopters, so we're going to see if this fixes it. To fit this in though, we've had to cut down one of our Besages, and we've cut down one of our Pithy Needle, which I'm not entirely sold by. I do like having Pithy Needles because they allow us to play around every copy of Wasteland our opponent has, or every copy of Caracas or whatever, so it's just really handy. But we're going to try out this Apostle's Blessing. We've only got one in the main, so it's kind of like the fourth copy of Not of This World, but it allows us to swing through so that we can't be blocked, which is really interesting. And we've got three in the sideboard that we'll talk about in a minute. We've got the normal spread of things in here that I would play. So we've got our four Urborg and one Yavimaya. So we have maximum ways, well, not maximum, but we have a lot of ways of making our turn three combo of Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, and one of these lands that turns Dark Depths into a mana producing land. So we can make turn three 2020 without worrying about counters. We've got the, some usual utility ones. We've got a Pajukabog we can go find. We've got the Ghost Quarter because we're going to be putting Pith and Needle on Wasteland, so we need to be able to blow up stuff underneath our own Pith and Needle. And we have a Sajiri Step to give our guy protection to swing through. So that's pretty much the main deck. Sideboard wise, we've got four pieces of Graveyard Hate in the form of Leon and the Void. This is just the best piece you can have to buy you a few turns at the start of the game, which is kind of what we need because we're a deck that aims to win usually turn three ish. We have four Abrupt Decay. The reason I like green black turbo depths is because we can actually reliably cast abrupt decay from the sideboard because we have two basics four fetch lands and then we also have these eight bits of mana here so we really only need to get one basic and we can usually cast an abrupt decay from the sideboard and we know it's going to resolve people are playing blood moon in decks with blue mana like sneak and show we don't want to have our thing that blows up their blood moon get countered so that's why i like the abrupt decay a lot we have some artifact in the form of two collector roof and a null rod uh, split the difference. No Rod is slightly easier to cast, so that sometimes comes up because we do have colorless lands in the form of Thespian Stage, and I have lost games before because I couldn't cast a Collector Roof on the turn I wanted. That was a bit annoying. We have one guy's blessing because Painted Servant exists, and buying an extra turn or two against Painted Servant while they find their Soul Guide Lantern or whatever is often enough to win a game. And this is a single slot on our sideboard that's always going to come up in that matchup, so it's very high value for a single slot. And then we have the Three Apostles Blessing I mentioned earlier. This is to give us a way of punching through Thopter tokens as well as just more protection for our creature. Normally I would run Steely Resolve, but trying Apostle's Blessing instead. I'm personally not convinced because I don't like the way that the mana of the deck gets so funneled into making your 2020 sometimes. You don't have spare mana to be casting things like Apostle's Blessing. But this is why we test, right? So we're going to give it a go today. It does mean that we're going to be a little bit pressured to not board out any of our fast mana, whereas in some matchups you kind of want to board out fast mana a little bit, but we'll see how it plays out. All right, so that's the deck. Check out the Patreon in the link, just below, in the link below if you're interested. I got some other content about Merit Lage decks, so there's an article on Rainbow Depths in there, and I'm working on an article for Slow Depths as well. So if that's your jam, why not? But also, just like and subscribe to the channel. That really helps. Okay, let's play some Green Black Turbo Depths. We're on the play for round one, which is a good place to be. Our hand does not make a 2020 and doesn't really do anything. So this is a pretty easy mulligan for us. This hand makes a turn one 2020 on the play. I think we'll keep this and we have to throw something back here. I think it probably needs to be the Besaju because we'll use this so we can dodge blockers. 
And if something goes wrong, we at least have the Dark Depths part of our combo back again. But yeah, let's see if a turn 1 2020 is good enough. Lotus Petal. Lotus Petal. Hex Mage. Let's see if we can have a Hex Mage. We have a Force of Will coming in from our opponent. So not having green mana now is a little bit awkward, but if we did have the Presage here, instead of the Dark Depths, then we're also not particularly close to going off again. So our opponent is probably... Ooh, okay. Maybe not. Um, we have choices about what, what, what we play here. If we can find one of our five things that give us multiple mana, we can play the Thespian Stage. But even if we don't... If we find fast mana, we want to play the Sejiri Step. So we've got six pieces of fast mana versus five pieces of the other mana that we get from this. Hmm, that's a tough one. I think because Sejiri Step might let us push through a blocker, I'd rather try and keep that back. So we're going to play the Thespian Stage, and we're looking for a Yavimaya or one of our Urborgs. So we've got five of those that we can hit, and that gives us a 2020. Right, Volcanic Island from our opponent. This is making me think Delverish. Let's see. There's a Wasteland. All right, that's pretty bad for us. Pithing Needle. Let's cast Pithing Needle and see what they sack, what they Wasteland here. I'm hoping they go after the Dark Depths. They could daze this, which would be really annoying as well. If they Wasteland our Thespian stage, yep, that's the best play they can do, which is pretty annoying. I think now, due to our mana situation, we will play this Sejiri Step. So at least we've got some mana in the pool to work with. Wish we had this Besager instead of this Dark Depths. Thoughts these that we can't cast. Let's pass the turn. We need multiple draws to be able to play this game. Alright, so we're looking at Grixis Delver over here, which is kind of the new hotness because Orcish Bowmasters is a very unreasonable Magic the Gathering card, so why not play it? This will have to get us a Bayou, but we already have the Wasteland covered. Let's try and thoughtseize our opponent, see what they're working with over there. They might cast the Bowmasters in response here, but we'll see what they've got. They could also cast a Brainstorm and hide some cards from the thoughtseize. We're just going to see what we find. A Brazen Borrower as a 3 1. Alright, so that's their clock. And they have two Lightning Bolts. Okay, so we're effectively at 14. So let's keep a. Keep an eye on some stuff. So a Thespian Stage does it for us here. A Crop Rotation can do it for us. Potentially, because we can Crop Rotate away a land into the Thespian Stage. We can like, get rid of the Dark Depths, then play our other Dark Depths as our land for turn. A Thought Seize. I don't want to cast this if they only have a Lightning Bolt in hand. It's just free damage that we don't really want to throw away. Right, so play the other Polluted Delta out, which makes me think that they're holding back a Force of Will, potentially, because why would you play that when you could Brainstorm it away? A Crop Rotation. So now we have to make a decision. Our opponent is kind of representing Force of Will over there. So if we take three from this, so we take six from this, and three from this over the next turn cycle. So that puts us down to nine, so that puts us to two. So if we cast the Thought Seas, we're dead anyway. So we can't cast the Thought Seas, we just have to go for it. So I think we go cast crop rotation, sacrificing this dark depths for a thespian stage. And pay around days here. And play out our dark depths. And next turn we can make a 2020. And that should be able to stop us from taking another three damage from this brazen borrower. The chance of them having multiple brazen borrowers in their deck is also quite low. So the ways they have of dealing with the Merit Lage token might be reduced, but I don't know if they're running something like Shoulder's Edict, which is quite a powerful card for this sort of situation that the Black Manor allows them. We do not have the luxury of casting this Dress. I think we just have to pass the turn and make a 2020. Coming in with a Borrower or not? They're not coming in with a Borrower. Okay, that means they're trying to chump block here, which is all right for us. Let's cast a Dress. See what we're working with over there. It's really bad and we have to thought seize. So lightning bolt to our face, as expected. And we get to see the rest of their hand. Lightning bolt to our face. Okay. It's not so good. Just a daze. Okay. So we've got attacks. They have a chump block here. 
and we're trying to make them not draw their fourth line in bolt. Then we play out our bio here so we can represent something like a crop rotation potentially. All right, this is the turn they need to find another line in bolt. Orcish Bowmasters doesn't do it. All right, we got there in the end. That was a tough one. But uh, yeah, we managed to get there. So we blanked their wasteland, which was pretty useful. Big fan of Pythonio in that situation. All right, so the Delver matchup, you say. But this is Grixis Delver, so it's a little bit different to how it used to be. So we're going to need to think carefully about how we want to approach this. So they'll probably have one, possibly two Brazen Borrower, and they might have zero to two Shouldered's Edict. These are the things we're going to have to beat. Brazen Borrower beats one of those. Discard Spells beat the other one. Question is, how do we want to tackle what our opponent is bringing in terms of creatures? Is this one where we would like some Abrupt Decays to buy us a little bit of time? So Abrupt Decay is similar to Apostle's Blessing in this matchup in the fact that it's going to kill their creature that they're hoping to block with, except they can't counterspell this. And this can buy us time. So I think in a lot of ways this is going to be better than Abrupt Decay, apart from when we get Petty Thefted. Which is hopefully what these not of this world are for. I don't think we want the blessing as well. So I think we'll trim this for, an, for a decay. And these thought seeds are a little bit awkward in this matchup. So I'll take a couple of those out for some more decays. And I think we'll run it like this. So I don't like boarding out crop rotation even into counter spell matchups because it's so hard to assemble your combo without it. Okay, so we have to we have our combo rolled up in our hand then we can keep this because we can get the other piece with the crop rotation here and not of this world that's also useful here i think we're supposed to see if we can waste a wasteland on one of our other things here so let's try the duress now all right so they're going to hide some cards of the brainstorm so we're making them do a suboptimal brainstorm if they try and waste on our bayou we can elvish spirit guide crop rotate so are you working with opponent, or are you going to daze this? A force of will is kind of annoying, actually, when we're trying to crop rotate here. Probably more so than the ponder. We'll take the force. We could crop rotate now that we know it's safe, but we don't know if there's a wasteland on top of our opponent's library, and we don't really want to play into that. We're going to use this as cover for a wasteland, so at least if they try a wasteland, we can turn it into something we want. The scoring Tarn. So they're probably just going to be Bowmasters into play soon, which isn't the fastest of clocks. So that's not too shab shabby for us. Play our Thespian stage here. And we're holding open the Spirit Guide into Crop Rotation. They didn't cast the Bowmasters at end step. That's very weird to me. Felt like you just want to get your clock running there. There's the DRC that we knew about. Sure. So you got two Mystery Cards. Right, we don't have to worry about the Mystery Cards anymore. Uh, but I think we do want to play out fetch hand first so we'll go duress target our opponent let's see what they're working with force of will pitching the ponder so orcish bowmasters and one other card in hand so we can turn this into a dark depths right now or we can wait one more turn and do it all at instant speed that seems a bit more solid to me and we'll do that this way we're playing around wasteland a bit better so whatever the one card in their hand is, they're really looking to protect it. I assume it's the... If it's a dress, though, then it, it can't be the Brazen Borrower. Maybe it's Submerge? We have that cover with Not of This World, though. So working our way through their tokens and things here. A Ponder. So they left the card on top with the Channeler. So the plan is next turn to do it all at instant speed in their end step so that maybe this Dragon's Ray channel will attack us. So we just got a free ride into their face if we want it. We got two cars in hand. A second crop rotation. That's certainly interesting to me. All right, so we'll pass the turn. We'll make a 2020 in our opponent's turn. Hopefully that'll be good enough to beat some face. We're not gonna try and block any of these. We're just gonna take the damage, give our opponent the minimum amount of information possible. Let's crack this first. Okay, so we get a basic forest. And we'll cast a crop rotation, sacrificing this basic forest. We will get this Dark Depths. 
we will target our dark depths with these two things. All right, make 2020. We have the knot of this world and we have crop rotation. Oh, actually we can't get serious depths in our hand. Let's give our creature protection from blue. This forces the borrower. Now if they have something like a shoulder edict, then we can go again with this Ferdinand Catacombs in our hand. Shouldred's Edict, there it is. Sure. So this is three, four, five, potentially. So we can make a 2020 next turn. There's a Wasteland, all right. If they Wasteland one of our things, we have to crop rotate it in response. But the inclusion of Shouldred's Edict into these Delver decks, because they're going Grixis with the Bowmasters is very bad news for us, just generally as a meta trend. Because normally Delve is a pretty good matchup, but the inclusion of Shouldered Edict as well is not great for us. All right, so there's a Murky Boy, quite large, quite in charge. And uh, Borg, is that the thing we want to play right now? Beating this Wasteland is going to be very, very hard. Let's play an Urborg. We kind of need our opponent to fire off the Wasteland so we can crop rotate in response. We're kind of needing our opponent to make a mistake here. We have to just make our thing double wasteland. Yikes. All right. Not sure we can even win this one in any way, shape, or form. Let's crop rotate this. So Jerry, step away. They're going to wasteland our Thespian stage in response. They're not going to. Interesting. All right. Like, they're just going to wasteland what we do in a second anyway. Either way, we're in trouble. So they let us sacrifice this one, then they blow this up. And then we lose the game. All right. Shoulder's Edict. Difficult to beat. Are we supposed to have more hand disruption to beat that? It's so hard to beat. I think maybe on the play, board back in the Thought Caesars, the Orcish Bowmasters effect. We're just a, a casualty of Orcish Bowmasters being good against other people, so that they play in black. What does our hand do? It thought seizes, and then we get to do some cool stuff. I think we can keep this. We we'll probably lead off on a um, pithing needle on wasteland, though. Wasteland, past turn. So next turn we can thought seize, and the turn after we can crop rotate for the win in theory. Elvish Spirit Guide, does that change anything right now? Uh, if we play this out. No, we still need an additional land here. So we'll play out our Thespian stage and keep this Spirit Guide as a little surprise for our opponent. We will Thought Seize them. They could have a Brainstorm here to hide, but this is, I think, the turn we have to do this. So we could run the... Uh, there's a land from original Zendikar set that when it comes into play, it makes a token creature, a 0-1 plant. That is a thing that you can run as a potential card to play around Shouldred's Edict. So you can crop rotate for a thing that actually counters it because you have like a little guy that you can sack instead. Is that a thing we want to be doing? I, I don't think so. But it's something to think about. Let's see what they're working with. Days, Merktide Regent, Ponder, Surgical Extraction. Hmm. We've got Days beat already. Surgical Extraction is kind of an odd one, because if it goes wrong and they surgically extract our thing, then we just lose. I'm not a fan of that. It's either that or the Ponder. I'll take the Extraction, I think. If we have to do multiple instances of the combo. There's the Underground C. There's the Ponder. They did not shuffle the Library of the Ponder. Not a fan of this. There's a Dark Depths. Let's play a Dark Depths. So our opponent can't tap below two mana now because Shoulder Edict and Petty Theft are both two mana spells. So they can play a land and play a one drop here. Let's play Delta. But we can't just make this into the face of cards they're keeping on top of their library. That doesn't feel like a good way of winning the game. If they tap out from Merktide, then we can crop rotate twice to get the Sejiri Step to punch through. Right, they're just passing. We're not going to do this. We're looking for a Thought Seize or something. A Besage you. Mm, that's not really going to cut it for what we're looking at here, is it? 
Like we can besiege you away an underground sea, but they're definitely going to have more. You need our opponent to tap down a bit lower. Obviously, Orcish Bowmasters doesn't really help us out here because we don't get to attack with our Dark Depths here. And now they get to put a creature on the battlefield. It's not the strongest of creatures for this particular matchup. But obviously, against any blue decks, it's very good. But for us, we don't really care about the Bowmasters. But the fact that it allows them to hold open their mana and then deploy a threat is the problem for us. We need to find a Thought Seize or a Duress. If we find a Duress, they'll almost certainly have a Brazen Borrower in hand. Because that's the one we can't take. So this is the Merc Tide. Yep. So we're running out of time to do anything here. Six, seven, eight. So we can take one hit. So this is the turn we're looking for a Thought Seize, really. We can deploy Elvish Spirit Guide. It doesn't stop Shoulder Zedic because Shoulder Zedic says non-token creature or token creature. So we found a Bayou. That doesn't do anything for us right now. So we need to... Yeah, this is going to be a tough one. We could have played the Spirit Guide out this turn. But that stops us from being able to activate our thing if they do tap down low. Now, I don't know why they would tap down low. But we still take 7 and then 6. All right, we got one turn to find the answer. That's not the answer. Even if we play this spirit guide out, we don't get there. We'll play our forest and we'll pass. So we now have to make our dark depths, which is then immediately going to die. Stifle, you say. Stifle is interesting. If that's what they've got, we can beat this. Um, yes, we can beat this. So we go green, crop rotate, sacrifice this forest. We have a force of will as well. So even if we crop rotate, yeah, this is still fine after a fashion. Um, so we go green, crop rotate this Thespian stage away into another Thespian stage. And we use the other spirit guide for the mana here. Let me get ourselves a 2020. We block the Merc Tide. Hopefully, like they might have the Shell Resilient as well, and we're just doomed. Another Stifle. Sure. All right. So I wasn't expecting them to be a Stifle deck as well. And we got absolutely smoked. Blue Red Delver was fine. That was a fine matchup. Even Rug Delver was fine. But the fact that they've now got Edicts as well as the potential for Stifle and all their other stuff is just a lot. This is a very bad development in the format for us Green Black Depths players. All right, let's go to round two. Right, our opening hand for round two does not have the ability to find a Dark Depths, so we need to mulligan it. All right, this has a turn three kill with protection through Wasteland. And a Thought Seize if we want it. I think we will ship the Bayou here. So we have different ways you can play this out. I think Urborg Pithing Needle is probably the best start for us. And then if our opponent is a blue deck, then we can do a Thought Seize before we try and go off. Which will be nearer, the, nearer to the time that we're actually going off. So we're more likely to hit the things. Whereas if we do this first, we expose ourselves to Wasteland. And also... So we can play a basic and, and Thought Seize. But we want the, this to get green mana. So that's not a real thing that we're going to do. And then... If we Thought Seize first and have a Wasteland, they can take this. And then by the time we get around to doing our combo for our crop rotation, they might have drawn an answer that they didn't have in their opener. Now, if they're a turn one combo, they can get us, and that's going to feel awful. But, okay, a Dark Depths, you say. Uh, I think we're supposed to play out the Verdant Catacombs here, so that we have access to Green Manor if we need an emergency Bajuka Bog. And then we will Thought Seize our opponent. Brazen Borrower. Annoying. Force of Will. Force of Will. Grief. This is going to be a slightly challenging one to muster through. If we take the Force of Will, they can Force of Will this crop rotation, but they'll cost them their Brazen Borrower. Or we can take the Brazen Borrower and try and force through the Force of Wills that way. Yeah, neither of those situations feels amazing, but I think that's okay. Mr. Rainforest. So this looks like the Bug Scam deck, would be my guess. Sylvan Scrying. Right. We're going to get a basic forest here. 
we will cast Sylvan Scrying. If they force the will this, it's much less of a downside for us because we're not losing a land to do it. They're cracking their polluted delta for a water gate. Okay, we're looking at shadow here. I see. A brainstorm. So they're looking for an answer. I imagine they're going to throw back their wasteland since we already have the pith needle out on it. They must have had one of these force of wills at the start and they didn't want a force of will pith needle, which is kind of interesting. When they had a wasteland in hand. Because the only people that are playing pith needle in the blind are people that don't want to get wastelanded. Are force of willing this one? A daze. That's annoying. Hey to our opponent. Alright, so grief pitching grief. We're going to lose our crop rotation. That's unfortunate. But our opponent's not really making inroads into winning the game yet, so. Is the water grave that we knew about? They laughed how we should just be getting dwindled down by these water graves easily. They shouldn't even be thinking about whether or not they want to pay the life because we're dealing increments of 20. So they want to be at one life as soon as possible. Well, maybe not one because of Force of Will and Fetch Lands, but. Right, they made a 1 1. So this wasteland has got to be gone right now. So we have this Dark Depths. Are we supposed to play this Hex Mage into a known Force of Will? Or are we supposed to wait and try and find a Discard Spell? I think that's the correct way of playing this turn. So we're just going to bide our time. If we find a Discard Spell, we can do it. If we find a Crop Rotation, we can do that as well. But we need to be able to force two things through in one turn to get around this Force of Will, really. Another Death Shadow, right? If they're still 1 1s, that's okay. But it gets a little scary when they find their next fetch land. A Verdant Catacombs. Is that a thing that's going to help us out? The game, there's no point playing into this Force of Will we know about. We just got to bide our time, try and find a discard spell. We don't even need to crack this Verdant Catacombs for mana at any point because it taps due to the Urborg. So if we can find like a second Hex Mage, we can deploy two. If we can find a Discard Spell, we can poke a hole first. Find a Crop Rotation or a Sylvan Scrying. This is one of the ways we get punished for doing that though. They also get to like take four life off themselves. So they kill us next turn. Our Hex Mage was not resolving because of the Force of Worlds. We're right to hold on to it. But Death Shadow is just such a strong deck. All right, we'll take 10. They get you from so many angles. Okay. That doesn't do it. We are Deadsville. Let's concede the game. Now, our opponent might have Shouldred's Edict, which is uh, another thing that is slightly difficult to play around. Hmm. What are we supposed to sideboard here? Honestly, I don't think we're supposed to sideboard anything. I think we're just supposed to run it back. Like, the Ley Lines can restrict some of their graveyard shenanigans, but we're not supposed to care about it that much anyway. This can protect us from Borrower. We could board in an Erupt K to maybe buy us a little bit of time. But the Death Shadow deck tends to disrupt you and then play a threat and kill you. Whereas Delver plays a threat and then disrupts you whilst it's killing you. So that's kind of the, the different nuance in the two decks. I think we're just going to run it back. So we can... Pithing Needle and Wasteland, then we can punch a hole with Thought Season, try and crop rotate our way to victory. This is fine. There's a lot of ways this goes wrong for us, unfortunately. You can get turn one discard, lose our crop rotation. That's pretty awkward. They could counterspell our Pithing Needle. Just thinking, what are we, which one are we actually supposed to cast? I think we are still supposed to play the Urborg here. So that way we, we have the turn three sewn up. But we could play out the forest first in case our Pithenia doesn't work. We're going to want black mana for turn two anyway. Okay, so we'll name Wasteland. And let's see how bad their turn one is for us. It could just be an innocuous little ponder. Just a friendly little ponder. Nothing, nothing to see here. Come on. All right, so we're getting griefed. Are we losing our crop rotation? Or are we losing our thought seas? Those are options, opponent. The thought seas is what they wanted to keep. Interesting. Oh, they're just taking them both. Okay. Not sure why they thought so long and hard about that one then. They just had it all. All right. So we can draw a dark depths and still win this game. 
We can draw another Urborg. Not really where I want it to be. Are we supposed to be playing this forest for the purposes of Besaidio? I think we're supposed to just play out the Thespian stage so that if we draw the Dark Depth next turn, we can go. That seems the most sensible to me. Right, we're taking three from the Grief. Nothing to worry about just yet. There's quite a few turns left to be played in this game. Brainstorm, certainly going to find our opponents some things that are going to mess us up, I'm sure. A Urborg means they can get mana out of their Polluted Delta without having to crack it. So shuffle with brainstorms, so it does help them a little bit. If they got good stuff they want and things they want to deploy for a black mana. But it turns out they didn't. There's a watery grave. This could be a death shadow. A thought sees. This is they get to see one card that they didn't know, but they also get to reduce their life total by two, which is actually worth doing. I think if they had just had a shock then, they would probably point it at themselves anyway. Pithing needle. Really want the pithing needle. We could deploy this just so there's a second defense on Wasteland. We could put it on something like Polluted Delta to stop fetches. Honestly, I think we're supposed to put it on Pith and Needle in case they... Well, the, thing, the way they're going to get rid of Pith and Needle is either Brazen Borrow, which they're just going to save for the Dark Depths token, or they're going to do it on um, Powder Keg type thing, which will blow up all of our Pith and Needle. So I don't think we're supposed to play the second Needle out. As annoying as that is. We don't want to besage them because then it can go and get a, a land. Which will make them lose life even more and make potential death shadows even bigger. Right, so we'll take the three. We've got some turns here. Merktide. The amount of turns we have has been decreased. Oh no, black mana. Maybe it's not Merktide. Thoughts he's tagging out. So we're going to lose this pith needle that we don't care about. And then they get the Merktide. Sure. Alright, so this is 7, 8, 9, 10. So we're not dead yet. We can take one hit. Another Pithy Needle, you say? That's always a fun one, isn't it? Uh, do I think this Besage is going to be worth more in our hand or in play? I think it's probably better in play here. So we have more mana to pay around things like Dazes when the time comes if we need to resolve a spell. So we need to draw Dark Depths next turn. Or we can draw Sylvan Scrying. That gives us a chance, at least. So this will attack will put us to four. And then the grief from the next turn will put us to one. So if we can block with the Lamarit Lay, we will be okay. This is a good example of why I didn't really want much in the way of uh, Abrupt Decays here. Because they can just beat you down with threats that cost seven and four. It's only really good against the builds that... Well, it's not even that good against the builds that have Baleful Strix. But it's okay there, at least. My opponent looks like they're just on the scam plan. Grief. If they were... Okay, so they're just going to take this. They don't have another reanimate, so they're showing us they don't have any counter spells either. So if we can draw one of our tutors, we're all right. We just drew another Urborg. Game over. Yeah, we just bricked out pretty hard there. We pretty much just drew la only lands and pithy needles from that point onwards. Uh, yeah, pretty bad. Like the first game, we tried to... We had these force of builds we needed to get through, and we just needed to find the thing to punch through it. But eventually they found a piece of discard, so they could take the thing that we were holding to try and double spell in a turn. This is kind of what happens with Toadep sometimes. You have your initial plan. If it gets disrupted, you're top decking trying to find the pieces, and it can be a bit awkward. And Death Shadow is a good deck. All right, we're well, 0-2. Not a great start. Let's go to round 3. Um, our hand has the stuff we're looking for to an extent. We will need to find more mana. So we've got 20, uh, so what, 18. So there's 20 land, there's 21 lands in a deck that produce mana, and we've got two of them here. So that's 19. So one in three cards. I might have to lead out on the Bajuka Bog. Yeah, this is an awkward hand. I think we're supposed to keep it. Like, the most abundant thing in our deck is mana. Because we've, we've got the land, and we've also got the fast mana. So when you total it up, it's close to half of our mana base. Oh, wow. Is this going to be a dredged play? And we're just going to play this Bajuka Bog on turn one. This could be helpful. Golgari Grave Troll and Bridge from Below. Say no to those things. Okay. Cabal Therapy. Targeting us. 
Sure. See what they name. Crop rotation. Sure, they got the crop rotation. We could have crop rotated in response there. But, all right, into duress. Kind of into duress here. So we go. Let's duress our opponent. Bridge from below. They won that in that great battle, unfortunately. But if they'd have had any of the looting effects, that would have been quite nice. So this turn we can, we can go and get Urborg, and then do a Vampire Hex Mage next turn. That seems fine to me. Uh, yeah. Let's go get an Urborg. And pass. So we can do. Uh, we can do the Hex Mage, or the Depths, or, or the Thespian Stage. So we've kind of got both angles. So whatever our opponent does, we can do. Um, we can respond to it if they hit this. All right. They can discard cards to give this flying. Not an unuseful thing. So, oh. Yeah, we can't do that right now, can we? Need to wait a turn. But next turn we have, if we lose this, we can then play the airborne and do this. If we did a crop rotate earlier for an airborne with the, instead of the Paducah Borg, we might have been in a better spot. So now they actually have the ability to put some cards in their graveyard, which is not great for us. All right. All right, let's scoop it up because we can just make our guy next turn, and they know that we've got the resources to do so. All right, sideboard in time. Four Lay Down in the Void, please. That's step one. Uh, guy's Blessing is not nothing. They're not really going to be targeting our guys, so these ones can come out. Pin the Needle name Cephalic Colosseum, so that's okay. We're probably looking at trimming a Thought Seize here. We don't want a Thought Seize and hit their creatures anyway. We just want to duress and hit their... Other bits and pieces. Apostle's Blessing to get through blockers is interesting though. So maybe we'll run a couple of blessings here actually. What does our hand do here? It's pretty slow. I think we're going to mulligan. We want something like a ley line ideally. Um, I think we're going to mulligan here. I keep chasing that ley line, I guess. Uh, this one is close to being good. I think we're just going to mulligan to a ley line there. All right. We'll keep. Uh, so, go with duress, duress. Uh, black source or green source goes. I think we want the two ley lines here because that's kind of what we mulligan to. I think we probably want to keep the besage you here because it, it does our, the things we need it to do. Now, on the play, we can try and have some different approaches to this matchup, like just making a really early. 2020. Right, let's play our green source. This can crop rotate into useful things if we can find a green source, cast our sylvan scrying, does all the things you want. That's why I think it's right to keep the green one. Let's just claim this is why I wanted both of these ley lines. A pithing needle. We will cast this on Cephalid Colosseum. They were F6 for our turns, so they didn't have a second way of blowing up our ley line. City of Brass. Tavern for black. Is this going to be a Cabal Therapy? No. They're just going to be casting Narc Weavers. Sure. This could be us, to be honest. A Dark Depths. All right. That's part of the equation. That's the hardest part of the equation to find, so that's good. Are you going to see another Narc Amoeba? A Golgari Thug. Sure. So we have the Blessing, so we can actually just sail through the air if we can ever make our 2020. And our opponent did give us a handy extra four life to work with. So... Not the worst. Sylvan Scrying. This, unfortunately, does not tap for mana. But if we can find another mana producing land, we can win the game. Right. A little bit of damage coming in. We're seeing an Archimeba. We're seeing another Thug. Another Thug. Sure. Okay. Not the land we wanted. I did say we want another land, so that's on me. The monkey's paw has curled another finger there. This is a seven turn clock because we're on 21. I imagine we probably can best a seven turn clock. A thespian stage. Okay, we'll cast a Sylvan Scrying. We will go and get ourselves an Urborg. This will help our opponent's mana out, but that's not really an issue here. We're just going to Apostles Blessing our creature to protect it from blue and sail through. If we don't have to, we won't use it straight away because our opponent might have Chain of Vapor or 
an echoing truth type effect. I don't want to get stung by that. Interesting. So we can play this Urborg and then we can duress our opponent and see if they've got one of those effects. Bridge from below, bridge from below, dread return. They do not have one of those effects. Okay. So we can make this at the end step and then we can give it protection from blue and we can kill our opponent. Opponent's got one card to draw this turn. They're conceding from the game. All right, powerful cyborg cards are powerful. Uh, so that's certainly something to be happy about, the four ley lines in the deck. Pretty happy about the fact that I shifted onto ley lines a while back. Is it for quite a while now? I just think it's, especially for leagues, it's just essential to have them because there's so many graveyard decks out there that people play in leagues. Not necessarily Dredge, more like Reanimator and the Storm decks that can race you using Echo of Eons, that sort of jam. All right, we've got one on the board. Let's go to round four. We have a natural turn three combo around counter spells, so I will keep this. There's a saga. Okay. What flavor of saga deck is this? Hard to say. Oh, we can lead out on Yavamaya, which is much better than Urborg here, because if we need to crop rotate for something, we at least have that option. So that's quite handy. Unlikely that we need to... Uh, uh, unlikely the Paducah Bog is going to really do the work for us here. Spire of Industry. So we're looking at some sort of eight casty type thing. Oh dear, oh dear. Okay, so we're going to be losing our ability to Thespian Stage here. So this is just Pithy Needle, but they get to peek at your hand first. So I'm going to name Thespian Stage. We won't be able to activate that targeting on Yavamai. So we need to find a um, Vampire Hex Mage or a Besaidu. Which we have access to. So that's not the end of the world. So we want to play here. We'll play the Thespian stage. Cast Sylvan Scrying. I'm going to get Besaidu who endures. Now they're probably going to get some other nonsense from there as a saga. Hopefully it will just be somewhere along the lines of an either spell bomb, and then we can hopefully beat that with our Not of This World. A Lion's Eye Diamond. Oh, we're that flavour of uh, as a saga deck. I see. Helm of Awakening. All right, things about to get pretty wild up in here. I imagine our opponent is playing the One Ring. Right, we're going for a spin. Oakley Doakley. Um. Okay, this hand kind of gets there. Now, whether or not this is the hand we're going to have when it gets to our turn, it's not. Okay. Elvish Spirit Guide, Elvish Spirit Guide. Why can't I have those alongside a crop rotation? Mishra's Research Desk. Our opponent's on some uh, some wild stuff over there. I guess Mishra's Research Desk's a zero mana things are kind of interesting. They're just one mana draw twos. Transmute Artifact. Um, do I want to exile one of these now? I don't think so. The reason we might want to do that is so we can crop rotate for a thing but they can because they wouldn't have any mana floating they just go to their next main phase so it doesn't really achieve anything in most of the time retrofits foundry okay how are you winning the game opponent that's the real question you can untap the monolith and start adding more to their pool if they want transmute artifact sacrificing the tapped monolith for a lion's eye diamond okay we're taking another spin Okay. If we get a turn, we can make a 20-20. I don't think our opponent's going to have Force of Wills in their deck, looking at how it's constructed. It's like a mono-brown deck here. Right, so they've got some cards in exile. Let's have a little look at these and see if we can work out what's going on. A Transmute Artifact. This is just a sort of Cabal Ritual for them, but it's a Cabal Ritual that, because it gets the Lion's Eye Diamond, which can put the Echo Vions into the group. All right. This is interesting. Saga Lantern, Transmute Artifact. Neither of these are things I particularly care about. Saga Lantern, sure. You carry on, opponent. Okay. So, we need to play out Dark Depths. Play out Pithing Needle. Uh, sorry, not Pithing Needle, Lotus Petal. We need to crop rotate this away for an Airborg. That lets us cast our Vampire Hex Mage. Do we want to be able to stop our opponent from doing stuff with their graveyard? Do we want to stop their retrofit as Foundry? 
So this is how much to make a servo. I think, I guess we can always crop rotate and response if we need to later anyway. So let's pick a needle from the retrofits foundry. Or are we naming Khan? This does feel like a Khan deck. I think we'll name Khan the Great Creator here. Oh, we still got one floating actually, haven't we? Um, that's fine. Can our big 2020 get there? All right. We've got some mana in there, Paul. We're going for a little spin, are we? Oh yeah, the Pissing Needle costs zero. That's why we have mana in that pool. Forget the Helm Awakening is double-sided. Transmute Artifact. This can go again on the Spyglass type thing. I think we're going to make our 2020 in response. This way we have the crop rotation if that's a thing we need to do anything with. If they get a an Aether spell bomb, that's no good for us. A Mystic Forge. Alright. Right, obviously didn't like the card on top of their library. Okay. I'm tapping the forge to have another crack at men in the top card of their library. They're trying to set themselves up so they can rinse through their deck. So everything costs cheaper, and they can keep on tapping their forge to scry the cards away. They've only got one Echo Vions left in their entire deck. We can go and get a Bajuka Bog if we feel the need. But usually when they put the Echo Vions into the graveyard, they do that, and then as soon as they get priority, they cast it. So you, there's never really a window to get rid of it. Exile top card of their library with the Mystic Forge. It was a Serum Powder. All right, so they're very, very all in on the combo here. We're paying costs for something over there. All right, they've conceded the game. Excellent. So I would very much like this Null Rod and these two Collector Roofs. I think that is step one. Uh, these Pit Needles seem pretty good too. I'm not sure how good Not of This World is going to be. I think, obviously, these things are just going to be better. Discard Spells. I imagine our opponent's going to have some number of Chalice. It does, inter it does step on the toes of their keys, but they're running Sorcerer's Spyglass as well, so it does really feel like Chalice is probably in there somewhere. So some number of Abrupt Decay should probably be something it should be in favour of things like Thought Seizes, perhaps. Like, on the draw, we can do things differently, maybe. Oh, sorry, on the play, we can do things differently. But I'd rather have this Apostle's Blessing to get through some little tokens. Maybe. Like we could have Ley Lines to shut off Echo Vion's plans. That's also fine. But where are we finding the space, I guess, is the question. We could do something like this. And just try and win the sideboard game approach. Just a lot of interaction there. Will I want some Apostle's Blessings? I don't know. I think I'm probably going to be happy with this duress, though. Right, we'll submit. So this is a turn to 2020. I think that's fine. I think we'll keep that. A lot of cards entered, including in Snaring Bridge, sure. We can get a Besage you if needs be. So, I think we play out our Bayou here and our Lotus Petal. So, we could play a Vampire Hex Mage now, and then if our opponent wheels us and we end up with Elvish Spirit Guide Crop Rotation, we get to kill them. And we do get to do that next turn anyway, so I think we'll just play this guy. Also, can interact with some of the other permanents. I don't think they're going to be a removal heavy deck, certainly not for a 2 1. Helm of Awakening, shot. Sure. One mana Sylvan Scryings, one mana Grip Monoliths, alright. Sorcerer's Spyglass, okay. They're going to name Vampire Hex Mage, Grinding Station, okay. Are they a mill combo deck? Interesting. Or are they milling themselves? They can mill themselves into their pieces. It's kind of interesting. A Sylvan Scrying. I think we will cast Sylvan Scrying. Go and get our Besagey. Right, a City of Traitors from our opponent here. Another Helm of Awakening. They have one card in hand. Interesting they're not milling either of us. I guess they want to try and play around a Bajuka Bog. Khan the Great Creator. That's a pretty good one. What are they going to go find? A Mystic Forge. Alright. 
Why are they a Yori on deck is another question. So many questions. Kind of cool though. Something a bit weird. Aetherflux Reservoir. Sure, that's the sort of thing I expected to see here. Chance for the Annex. Defense Grid. This is an interesting prospect for us. Are we supposed to fire this off now? I don't think so. We can go and get a Dark Depth so we have the Dark Depths in play. I think that's probably worth doing here. I haven't seen any of our gross destroying artifacts type stuff yet. Or well, not destroying, but neutering. All right, let's just sack the defense grid straight away. Okay. That is so frustrating, says our opponent. Um, go attacks here. At Khan. And I think we play. We need two green here, right? We need. We need green for this and green for Besagey. We don't really need to crop rotate, actually, do we? Um, we'll play this one out. And we'll pass. Alright. We don't want to fire this off until we know that they're not going to have an ensnaring bridge in play. Grinding station. Manifold key. So they're looking for an echo by the looks of it. A serum powder. Okay. This is an artifact that costs them two mana but produces a mana. So it's mainly just there to sacrifice the grinding station. They found an Echo of Eons. So I can crop rotate right now and get rid of this Echo of Eons. Which I think I want to do. Because there's a trigger on the stack, I get the chance to actually deal with this. It feels like us dying is a thing that can happen here. So even though we're a bit slower here because of it, I think it's okay. So they're going to have to sacrifice more of their stuff if they want to find another Echo. Right, they give themselves a 2-2. Two -two. They're just going to bash. We can't make our Dark Depths because they still have their Spyglass. So we can't do this combo yet. The Besage you, if I had a Legendary creature, then we could do it a little bit cheaper. Right, so we got the Mystic Forge untapping. Ottawara. A lot of cards on our opponent's Exile right now. And Mox Opal. Sure. So this is going to give them a mana, and then they're going to grindstone themselves, grindstone station themselves. Right, no echo. We've taken two echoes out of their deck so far. They've got a lot of cards left in their library because they're a Yorion deck. Etherflux Reservoir. That's a whole thing, isn't it? Grim Monolith. Okay. Can they get up to lethal damage here? They need 50 spare life. So they need to get to 51 to kill us. Ah, oh, the Mistress Research decks within Unearth makes more sense to me now. Lion's Eye Diamond, that's a pretty good one. It gives them a lot more mana to cast stuff off the top with the Forge. Provided they can cast what's ever on top of their library. Because the Grinding Station's gone now. They do have a blocker to keep their card alive though, which is potentially annoying. A good time to find one of our horrible Null Rod effects. Elvish Spirit Guide. Um, interesting. We could take out the Helm, take out the Khan, take out the Helm, kill the Khan, or do you want to kill this Aetherflux Reservoir? Um, we've got a lot of options actually here. I think step one is oh, our two bios are already gone, so this has to be a forest that we get. That's important. Let me play out this Erlog. How bad do we think the top of our opponent's deck is going to be for us? We definitely don't want this Khan to be a thing that we play against. So we very much like to kill this Khan. We can do that either by Sorcerer Spyglassing them away. Or I think because we have the Spirit Guide here, we have multiple ways of doing this, right? So we'll Sylvan Scrying for Thespian Stage. And then if we go to Attacks, if we attack... They'll just block here, and then their Khan will live. And their Khan living is an issue for us. I think we do have to kill the Helm. So this, exile this. Do they have a land they can fetch? They have a single island, sure. Attack Khan. I'm more scared of Khan than I am of the other stuff right now. That could be wrong, but Khan can just go get Lattice Lock for next turn, so we would just lose that. Have a first stage for next turn so we can at least make our 
2020 next turn. Our opponent needs to cast quite a lot of spells to get their Aetherflux Reservoir on the go. And they don't have any untapped for their forge. Uh, they don't have any research desks in their graveyard. So they can't get those back. We have made it so they can tap Ancient Tomb for black and not take two life. Okay. So. What have we got here? A Pithing Needle. Interesting. We'll play out this. Good attacks. What am I most scared of my opponent having at this point? I think it's another Khan. Uh, so there's still one Khan in their deck, and they can echo them back in. So I think we do play the Pithy Needle on Khan, the Great Creator. I'm more scared of that than I am of the Aetherflux Reservoir. We could put it on Mystic Forge. I'm tapping Grimoneth, sure. I think Khan is the thing I'm scared of. If they get us with their one untap with Mystic Forge, then fair enough. But if they just top deck Khan, we lose the game at that point, because they just ensnare and bridge us, and then Lats lock us, and then we're done. Ooh. Okay. We're getting some new cards. This could go wrong for us. So we can Abrupt Decay something here, if we want to. What exactly would we Abrupt Decay is the question. A Lion's Eye Diamond? I can just crack it immediately and go for another echo here. So we're going to see an echo here. So I think we we can go black. We can go black, green, blow this up. Use the green from this to then besage you the Aetherflux Reservoir. That seems okay. Let's exile this. Blow this up. And then we'll make our 2020. This will make our besage you cheaper. Do I have another island? They do not. Okay. So what do we have here? A whole bunch of stuff. Can't really use any of it though. Monolith. There's one Echo Beyonds in their graveyard. In their library. All right, so they've gone up to 21. That is an annoying number for us. Do they have their final Echo Beyonds in hand? That would be really tilting. We have drawn a lot of cards, right? So. We can pick the needle of the Etherflux Reservoir. We can abrupt decay something. We're playing a Khan. We have this Pithy Needled, so that's... Alright, so they're going to keep going with this Mystic Forge plan. A defense grid. Okay. Oh, that's enough, is it? I didn't realize that was going to give them enough to kill us. Alright. Okay, I see what's going on here. So... Discard is going to be very useful right off the bat. I think the Abrupt Decays are something we still want as well, though. Just boarding all these in. Would I rather have these dresses or these ley lines? These ley lines stop them doing constant wheels. But the dresses and Thorses kind of stop them playing the game. Interesting. I don't think we need a Ghost Quarter. So that gets us one of these. So we can have a dress. Do you want to... Trim a lotus petal, a couple of lotus petals for some more dresses. Yeah, let's get some more thought seasons in there. Um, decays are okay. I just want to punch a hole so we don't lose straight away. Sure, let's try this. I like the spirit guides because they can add mana on our opponent's turn if we go end up going through some wheels. But this is not a matchup I'm wholeheartedly prepared for. Uh, I don't like this one very much. It's mulligan. Uh, what does this hand do? Turn one, Pithy Needle, turn two. <clears throat> do you want two Pithy Needles or do you want a Pithy Needle and Abrupt Decay? That's the real question here. I think we probably throw back a Pithy Needle. Chance of the Annex. A bit rude. I think we just have to play this out so we can cast the Collector Roof next turn. We're not going to pay here. That does mean they have a dud card in hand. If we get to our next turn, then I think we win the game. If we get to put the Collector Roof into play. It's going to be Chalice and Defense Grid. Okay. They're going to line our Diamond and go here. Do they just have the perfect seven? They did. Okay. It's pretty annoying. Now, their deck can spin their wheels a bunch of times and not actually do anything. So, it's kind of the problem with these, like, uh, Khan Echoes decks, is that sometimes they just don't do anything because they've got so many A plus Bs going on. Okay. So what do we want here? We can go... We do need to cast the Thought Seeds this turn, I think. 
So let's talk to his other opponent. Um, we can shut off these two Khans, that's fine. Marathon Key, Soul Guide Lantern, Transmute Artifact. Okay, I guess we take the Transmute Artifact here. And play out this Pitting Needle, and Khan the Great Creator. And then pass. Next turn we can play Dark Depths and Abrupt Decay something. So this is gone. This is the Earth of Saga, that's fine. There's the Soul Guide Lantern. Goodbye to our Thoughtsies. There's the Manifold Key. One Mystery Card in hand. Kind of awkward. Um, I would definitely play our Dark Depths anyway. We can't blow this up. But we can blow up the thing they find. We can blow up a token if they're just going tokens. We don't really care about tokens. Serum powder. Not very exciting. Let's crack this. Let's get our basic swamp. Let's make our little hex mage. And let's pass. So I haven't shown us Pithy Needle from this saga. I think maybe... Do I think they're going to have more likely to have Pithy Needle or the bouncy one? The... Uh, well, if they have Pith and Eel, we can beat that anyway. So, because we've got the Thespian stage. If they have either Spell Bomb, that's more annoying for us. We can abrupt decay it, though. So, I think this is. It does give our opponent more turns, but they're kind of running on fumes a bit over there. A Pithing Needle. So, this is. Yeah, so this is the thing we have beaten if we want it to be beaten. We have it beaten in two different ways, so. A Mystic Forge. It's a pretty good one. Manifold Key, Mishra's Research Desk, Mox Opal. Maybe we are supposed to try and dodge the Aether Spell Bomb and just make the 2020. But I don't know why you'd be playing a blue deck with Ezra Saga if you're not going to have an Aether Spell Bomb in there, just as an option. Transmute Artifact. Sure. Right, so there's the Reservoir. At any point, if we drew a one of our guys, the like, if we either drew uh, Null Rod or Collector and put it into play, uh, I don't think our opponent can beat those at all. So maybe we could draw one now. A crop rotation. It's not quite the one we want, is it? So we can go to attacks here. Can we do anything to interfere with this Etherflux Reservoir? I don't think so. We can blow up a key. If we want to. So we need three mana. So this three mana makes our thing. So we can abrupt decay right now to get rid of something. So we could abrupt decay away the key so they have less options. I don't hate that. So we can go goodbye to the key. That's one less activation they have. Or we could get rid of the mocks because that's one less mana they have. And mana's a bit of a gate for them here. Sure, we'll try this. Green. And do we have any interesting crop rotation things here? We can turn this, we can ghost quarter this away if we want to. Is that better than Bajuka bogging our opponent? Let's crop rotation this away. Let's get a. Oh, we took out the ghost quarter actually, didn't we? Um, that's still fine. Let's just exile. In the graveyard here. So there's loads of good stuff here that so include the Mishra's research desk. So they've got whatever the top card of their library was last turn and whatever the top card of the library is this turn to work with. City of Traitors. Okay. A Serum Powder. Okay. A Mox. Okay. We need them to brick a couple more times. Right, they've got one more untap here. And one more mana. Another land. Quite tense. Wasn't expected to play a game this long. I need to hit run and runner quite a few times to get this Etherflux Reservoir to get them above 20 life. All right, so we won that match. Um, so the high power level of what this Khan Echoes deck can do is sometimes brought down by the fact that you are just hoping that the top card of your deck keeps you going and your combo can just sort of stop. Uh, we didn't draw any of our artifact stuff. I don't know if our opponent had any way of really dealing with that. If we'd have just put like a turn one collector roof into play, I think we would have been golden. But yeah, so we got another win. We're going to the final round looking for the positive record. We got another Yorian opponent. Our opening hand doesn't make a dark depth, so I think we're going to mulligan this one. 
This does get us there. I think we can keep this one. I have to throw one of these cards back. Pretty tough sell which one we want to throw back, to be honest. I like having two bites of the cherry with the two things. So we have two tutors, which is quite nice. I don't really want to get rid of any of our lands, that's for sure. I know a spirit guide is good wasteland protection because we can crop rotate in response if they go for it. But I do like having a thought seize here as well. Maybe it's a sylvan scrying that goes. That feels awkward though. Or is it the hex mage? Maybe it's the hex mage. Because we do need a second black for that anyway. Prismatic Vista. So we're looking at possibly some sort of control deck. That's usually what's running Prismatic Vista. Right, this is Bant, Delighted Halfling. All right, our opponent's on some new stuff. Let's have a look at their opener and see if we can work it out. Force of Negation, Omnath Ponder. Interesting. We can cast Omnath pretty soon. What is, is it? Is it four life straight away? Whenever the man is four life. Oh, it's kind of annoying, isn't it? Uh, I don't really want to get Force of Negation. That's, I think we have to take the Force of Negation here. Not a big fan of what our opponent's doing. Are we making a turn three Omnath? And then they'll gain some life, and then we won't be able to kill them in one hit. Very rude. I imagine there is Uro in our opponent's deck, and probably Teferi as well. This is sort of like the next iteration, I imagine, of the um, Green Sun Zenith Yorion decks. This card pretty good. Doesn't even die to Orcish Bowmasters. There's the Ponder we know about. So I think we play Stage and Sylvan Scrying next turn. Then hopefully we can hold up the Spirit Guide as a bonus way of getting extra mana for the turn we go off when they don't expect it. And maybe that'll be enough. Another Delighted Halfling with different art. We're getting attacked for one. Here come the beats. Green and colourless. Let's go and get ourselves a Dark Depths. And pass a turn. So they can jam it on that this turn. And then gain four life, which doubles our clock, which is kind of annoying. Here's the Omnath, as expected. They get card, they get to gain four life. Yep. Pretty annoying. That's normally the worst clause that <laughs> Omnath has. But against us, it's kind of the best one. We'll play our Dark Depths. We have an option to wait and try and get protection from something like a Source to Plowshares. We'll see. Abundant growth. Sure. If our opponent taps out of all their white sources, then we might be inclined to... There is a wasteland. Okay. It's an annoying one. But we do have a way of beating this. Because, you know, that's what our deck does. Put Yori onto hand. Okay. We're going to get bashed up a little bit here, aren't we? This is pretty handy. So this is the three mana we need. This is the crop rotation we need. So let's... Thought sees our opponent first. Force of will. Can't really beat the force of will here. Um, we could take the Yori on here. It kind of does both a little bit. Yeah, if we take the Yori on here, then they can't force of will because they don't have a blue card. And then we tap for green and we cast crop rotation, sacrificing our bayou. We're supposed to do this later, aren't we? I think we made a mistake here. Yes, you made the mistake. We're supposed to do this in our opponent's turn. We're playing around the Force of Will. Yeah, we've made a mistake there. Because now they can Wasteland us in the main phase so that we have to make it and then they're Prismatic Ending us. Yeah, that was a, a bit of a swing and a miss from us there. Ah, this Omnath though. Very rude. We're going to bash us for six. Just to four. Okay. Oh, they've made a mistake here. That's good. So... We can make a 2020, but we're going to need to find some protection. So let's hit this ghost quarter on this wasteland, targeting this. Interesting. This is going to basically remove all of our mana sources here. Thespian stay. It's not really going to do it, is it? So there's four, five, six. And this is going to get prismatic endinged. And then we didn't find a protection spell. We kind of had to go because of how low our life total was getting. Yeah, this is an awkward one. This gain for life on the Omnath is pretty brutal. Yeah. Omnath having this largely redundant text pretty much won them the game there. 
Yikes. Uh, I guess we need more protection for our guy. They've shown us Wasteland in their four color deck because of course they did. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess we're trimming a couple of those for a couple of blessings. And we need one more thing. So we need to protect against Wasteland, possibly Caracas too. So Jerry Step is going to be useful. Ghost Quarter is going to be useful. Pajukabog are going to have Uro in their deck. Trim one of these just to get the other blessing in. Sure. Feel like we're going to struggle here. Now they are a Yori on deck, so they have to find the right cards in a much bigger stack of cards. So there is that. All right, might have to mulligan deep to find something really good here. This is the first time we've really had a matchup where we want the Apostles' Blessings. So that's the thing we wanted to test today, so that's nice, I suppose. Um, another Black Source makes his hand very good. Any other land makes us make the guy without counter spells. I guess we keep. Oh, Omnath, why do you do these things to me? Prince gone to six cards. Maybe we can collapse their hand with an early thought seize. I do think this has to be a buy you. I don't think they're waste landing our first land here. Let's see what they're working with over there. Green Sun Zenith, Omnath, Prismatic Ending, Swords to Plowshares. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Um. What are we taking here? Weird, I think we might be taking the Omnath. As insane as that sounds. The 4 life is... It's like a time walk on a 4-4. It's so gross. Right, we're going to play in a way that... So if we don't take the Omnath, and we take one of these, if they draw another one of these, then we have to play around a Sorcery Speed and an Instant Speed one, because we're going to take more than one hit to kill them. And I don't really want to be in that situation. I want to just get our opponent dead in a single hit. There's a Flow Strand from our opponent. I'm cracking it. We're probably going to see some sort of trop, I would imagine, into a Green Sun Zenith for Dried Arbor. A Savannah into a Dried Arbor. Yeah. I guess this makes sense. They want to get some white mana underneath them. Not of this world. Not bad. Are we playing the Stesman Stage or are we playing the Dark Depths? I think we play the Dark Depths. That way, if we draw an Urborg, we can do that. And if we draw... If we don't, we can then... Navigate the turn differently. And if our opponent wastelands our Dark Depths, it doesn't matter as much because we have another one saved up. The old four-color wasteland decks. There's a Prismatic Vista. I think it cracks straight away, which makes you think our opponent's probably got something. Ice Fang. An array. Another creature that puts their life total above 21. Above 20, sorry. Okay. It'd be nice if our opponent would fetch land themselves into... The grave. Okay. So we can play a Lotus Petal. We can play a Thespian Stage. We can play a Hex Mage. And we've got two forms of protection for our 2020 when the time comes. Are we supposed to play around Wasteland here? No, I don't want to play around Wasteland. They're better going to have it now. They didn't play a land last turn either. Off the Euro. So I don't think they have a land in hand. Now if their draw was exactly Wasteland, then that's kind of annoying. We do need to fade both of the removal spells in their hand. A Brainstorm. Now I think we're going to make our guy. Maybe we are supposed to make it in their upkeep. Just dodge the Wasteland that we know about. So we've got Apostle's Blessing and Not This World to fire off here. But we do need to get through both of these spells in our opponent's hand. Let's go for Apostle's Blessing. Target this one. Give it protection from white. Play this Dark Depths. Go to attacks. Let's shut off our opponent's fetch lands. We have to survive this source to plowshares. Which we do have a thing for. But if they do kill it, we can then make another one. So it's not the end of the world. They're pondering first to try and get more ways of disrupting our creature. Just getting the most amount of information before they try and tangle with it. Because they could get some sort of counter spell here. They shuffled their library. Okay, that's good. Caracas here would be a real pain. Not even attacking the Dried Arbor. So they might have a force of negation here. Attacks. All right. So that worked. The Apostle's Blessing and an additional way of getting around it seemed to work all right there. How would that have compared to a Prismatic Ending? That's a question. Uh, sorry, not Prismatic. A uh, Steely Resolve. So with this, if we had the Steely Resolve, they could have 
use one of their removal spells on the Steely Resolve, so it kind of would have ended up in a very similar fashion. All right, let's... I like the Elvish Spirit guys more than the Lotus Petals on the whole because these allow us to surprise them with a spell. Uh, yeah, that's the we just submit here. Uros and Omnas. That's a lot of ways of getting their life total above the big 2A. Kind of an awkward matchup. Now they're on the play, they're more likely to gain the life and then be able to untap and have some stuff going on. Because as soon as we don't kill them in one hit, we're worried about things like Teferi and Prismatic Endings that are normally things that we can dodge and just say, no, we're just going to kill you in one swing. But having to survive through Sorcery Speed spells as well as Instant Speed spells is, is a bit much. Our opening hand here doesn't have access to Dark Depths, so we cannot keep this. This opening hand is pretty good, though. We'll keep this. And one of these has got to go back. I think it's the second Hex Mage. Is it the second Hex Mage? Yeah, I think it's the second Hex Mage. Or is it the Thespian Stage? Maybe it's the Thespian Stage. Putting back a land feels awkward. So this is the way that plays around counter spells. We can always crop rotate. Yeah, I'm going to try to put the stage back and just going in on this plan. So we're going to try and force our way through two counter spells using both Hex Mages. Windswept Teeth being cracked. Hope all their lands are fetch lands so that they uh, can't, if they gain life, they don't go over 20. A Ponder, that's a pretty good way to start going Magic the Gathering, I've heard. That's a good one. Right, our hand is coming together in a big way. Let's thought who's our opponent who's on four cards over there. Abundant Growth, Ice Fang, or Swords to Plowshares. Interesting. I think it's actually the Ice Fang. This forces them to hold mana open on their turn. And it's going to be easier for us to get through a plow, I think. Sure. If they have a wasteland, we can always do that. But our plan is to Sajiri step our way through the plow. They didn't shuffle off the ponder, though. So maybe they've got something scary. There. So next time we can make the Hex Mage. And if they leave just one mana open for a plow, then I think we'd probably go. And then we can crop rotate our way to victory. There's the Misty Rainforest. So they can put an opponent in growth. So they will have white mana if they want it. Right, they're cracking their Misty Rainforest. 18. Let's have another fetch. Then we can get through a single Uro. In terms of the amount of life they have. A Savannah. Abundant Growth on the Trop. Prismatic Ending on the Lotus Petal. Alright. That's an annoying one. So we have that to play around the Wasteland. So now we play this game of play out our Dark Depths. Play out our Hex Mage. And they have to keep a mana open at all times. Now, if they have a wasteland here, we get super punished. All right, no wasteland. And this is a fetch land, so even if they cast an Uro. If they go Uro into fetch land, that'd be a little bit annoying. But, sorry, Uro into wasteland, that'd be a little bit annoying. But we can beat that with our crop rotation. We're not going to make our 2020 in the face of that source of plowshares we know about. An Apostle's Blessing. That's a nice one, isn't it? Uh, in case they have... An endurance. I kind of don't want to attack, but if they have an endurance, then that's a turn off that they aren't killing our thing. We do have two layers of protection here. A brainstorm. Okay, so we're not looking at a neuro, uh, a an endurance here. Could be an ice fang, but we have first strike to cut through that, so I don't really mind. We have apostle's blessing plus the jury step. There are two ways of protecting against this source of plowshares that we know about. Which is definitely still going to be in our opponent's hand. They're not going to shuffle that one away. This two life means an Omnath will put them to 20. So we still have a one shot kill. A little bit tight with the mana to cast our Apostle's Blessing here. We do have enough. Three cards in our opponent's hand. Uh, let's float a mana first. So this is the plow. Um, what, is, what are we removing here? I think we go add green, add black. I'd rather have the green, so I'm going to crop rotate this Urborg away for the Sejiri step to give our creature protection from white. All right, let's scoop it up. We got the win there. We didn't have to use the Apostle's Blessing, but it was there if we needed it. So we finished with a positive record, which is pretty nice, but we did kind of get rocked by the sort of Delver and the Delver adjacent Death Shadow. So let's talk about the deck. The things that beat us is the fact that Blue Red Delver is no longer Blue Red Delver. It's his 
Grixis Delver, which means it has access to some different tools. So that list we played against had Stifles, but I've seen other ones playing Thought Seizers. So again, kind of a problem for us to deal with. The Bowmasters, the only thing that Bowmasters interacts with us is the fact they can hold mana open and then play a threat while still holding mana open, which is certainly useful against us. But in terms of how good Orcish Bowmasters is against the rest of the field, it's pretty, pretty small potatoes. But the problem for us is that they're playing black, so they get to play this Shoulders Edict, which is really hard for us to beat. In terms of the Death Shadow matchup, that was the, the sort of the quicker scan build. So it's got discard. So it's got more discard than regular Shadow. So it's got your sort of eight pieces of discard. It's got four Wastelands, which is another thing you have to get around. And then it's got a whole bunch of counter magic. So it's got a lot of lines of interaction. The one downside for the Shadow player is they don't have that much in terms of things that interact with our actual 2020 once it gets into play. So they have sometimes Shouldred's Edict, but usually one to two Brazen Borrowers. So you're maybe looking at three, possibly four cards in their entire 75 that can deal with the 2020. So that's a tricky one for sure. But if you can smash down an early one and you're pretty good, now, our build today had three Pithing Needles in. If you follow my primer or you watch my channel, you'll know that I'm a big fan of four Pithing Needles. So we cut a Pithing Needle to fit in this Apostle's Blessing. However, the games we lost were against decks with Wastelands in. So if we'd have had a fourth Pithing Needle, I probably would have been a little bit happier there. So I think with, like, Delver was the most played deck before Bowmasters came out. Not by much, but by a little bit. But now Bowmaster's out, I expect Delver to be shooting up back to not quite as extreme numbers as it was before, but it's going to sort of pull away as the best deck, I think, because it just gets to use those tools more effectively than other decks do. So that's certainly a thing. We didn't really miss having one less Besaidu. So maybe opening up that slot by cutting the Besaidu is a thing that we can continue to do going forward. I'm definitely going to try some more games with it. We've sort of got ourselves another space. I kind of feel like if this Apostle's Blessing was a Pithin at all, we'd have been in a little bit of a better spot here, especially since we're trimming on lands so and makes the Blessing a little bit awkward. And then, then there's the round that we actually did board in the Blessing. We boarded out some fast mana to fit it in, which at the top I said is not really a thing you want to do, but because they're a slower deck, we kind of get the time to do that. And because they're gaining life as well, we need to defeat multiple pieces of removal. So I kind of need need them somewhere and we can't really skimp on the other tools because they're all kind of essential at that point what i will say is i'm not sure how good apostles blessing is going to be against aggressive white decks that can have like the removal that you're trying to sort of stop because against aggressive white decks what we used to do is go okay we'll do steel resolve on turn one or two and then turn two or three we'll make our 2020 that was a pretty solid plan however now if you add in the apostles blessing that becomes more difficult but what are the aggressive decks at the moment it's probably initiative is like the aggressive white deck. I don't think Death and Taxes really counts in that front. Death and Taxes kind of is very mid-rangey. So you get a little bit of time to work some stuff through on that one. But again, that's a matchup where you want Pitting Needles. What I will say is Bowmasters is also kind of useful against the initiative. Now, it may not seem like it on paper, but they do have a bunch of X-1s like Thalia and the... Elite Spellbinder are ones they can hit. But also, making two bodies for one card means that you can steal the initiative off a player a lot more easily. So I think maybe initiative will take a little bit of a downturn in uh, the near future. So maybe Apostle's Blessing is an interesting direction to go. We didn't play against eight cards, which is one of the things I really wanted to try it against because the idea of just getting protection from artifacts uh, and just swinging through the, the horde of Thopters whilst also dodging chalice the void felt pretty good and it kind of fits a spot that steely resolve doesn't really help you in in the eight cast matchup whereas apostle's blessing does and apostle's blessing didn't really help us versus the delver and the shadow matchup either but that's fine too we we can kind of kind of live with that and use some of our other slots i think going up to a fourth pity needle is a good way of trying to address the Delver thing. So if I was to run this back in a league right away, uh, I still want to test these Apostles' Blessings. 
So what I think I would probably do is run something like this. So we've got, so turning this into a pith and needle. So just changing this one card out and leaving it roughly the same. I know some people like to cut the Yavimaya out of the deck, but I, I'm just not a fan of that. I think having the five cards that just give you the three card combo that ignores counter spells is really nice. And sometimes you do need multiple green in a turn. And anything that turns Dark Depths into a mana source is just so useful for like deploying all the things you need to do. So I'm, I'm still a fan of Yavimaya. Sideboard wise, I think I would probably run run it back again. So we'd have these slots for eight casts. Potentially we could even board in some abrupt decays against eight casts, but I think actually you've so you've got what three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a, too many cards, I think, to be boarding in against eight casts. But you could board them in and have things like the Duresses and Thoughtseize go. Now these do puncture hole for counter spells. That's true. But the things we're bringing in are kind of game breaking in terms of like the collect throughs. Actually, no, we bought out the Knot of This World in that matchup, don't we? So that's three slots. And there's seven. So you don't need to find a little bit more. I think you still want Ghost Quarter for the purposes of the Urza Saga. Same reason you want Pithy Needles. So you can stop Urza Saga or you can stop either Spellbomb or Ottawara. Because the Apostle's Blessing doesn't stop the Ottawara, which is important to note. So something along those sorts of lines I'd be thinking about. Obviously, one drops into a Chalice deck are kind of awkward, but maybe you could just go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Maybe just bring in three of these. So you get rid of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Leave yourself a couple of Thoughtsies, or probably a couple of Duress, maybe, just so you can punch through and sort of take some counter spells. Something along those lines. Maybe you can trim on Pith and Needles in that matchup as well and keep more discard in. But that's kind of what we're trying to tinker with at the moment. It's trying to find a slightly better configuration against the 8-cast decks. But also we're looking to try and beat the the Grixis Delver, which is sort of the new best deck in my opinion. That we're going to have to puzzle our way around. I think having a fourth Pith and Needle was definitely the start of approaching that matchup. Maybe Veil of Summers is where we need to be, but where are we fitting them in is the question. Maybe we can trim one of our Null Rod effects and give ourselves one, and then maybe trim an Apostle's Blessing, and then we get two Veil of Summers there and two Apostle's Blessing, and that makes boarding slightly easier in some of the matchups, but then we only have two ways of getting through the artifact hordes from 8-cast. So whatever we do, we're going to be losing some of our matchup so there's never a like you can find the optimal build but the optimal build is based on the percentages of meta decks so you are going to have to give to some matchups to improve your other ones and quite how we do that is and making sure we do it the right way for the right tournament is kind of magic in a nutshell right anyway i think i've rambled on enough about this one if you're interested in this deck please 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 check out my patreon uh the 2020 specialist tier has articles about um, Turbo Depths decks and there's a Slow Depths deck article that's going up uh, in a couple of weeks and there's also the big primer for Greenback Turbo Depths you can have a look at too which gets updated every month so if you're subscribed you'll get all the new updates and the next update is going to be very big because the format's taken a massive shift with Lord of the Rings and you can also just give me a couple of quid a month on my Patreon as well and say thank you for making content I'd appreciate that um, obviously only if you are financially able to and if you're not financially able to help me why not like and subscribe? I think 60% of my viewers are not subscribed. So why not hit that subscribe button? It really helps. It pushes me in the algorithms, gets more people watching my stuff and ultimately gets me a little bit more money along the lines, which sadly is a thing we're all grasping for these days. All right. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.